members, Margaret Andrews and Mark Moore, also worked at ERS as part of their careers. And I'm glad to have had the opportunity to work closely with them. Other panel members, Christine Olson, Stephen Carlson, and Gary Bickle, I have seen in action at meetings of conferences. The contributions of any one of these folks to the field of insecurity is impressive. And their collective contribution is downright astounding. So astounding, in fact, that it reminds me of another famous group, and, well, I'll admit it, of my personal trouble at home with my wife. <laughs> Earlier this summer, Mrs. Prowl and I watched a marvelous PBS series that originally aired some years ago. I don't know what I would do without Netflix or a wife who enjoys finding hidden gems for us to share. She found a six-part biography on John Adams, really about John Adams and Abigail Adams in an equal partner marriage that was perhaps distinctive for the 70s and Mrs. Pearl and I enjoyed the series immensely, and soon after she got a biography for me from Amazon.com, declaring it to be Founding Father Summer she picked up some light reading for me about George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben Franklin. <laughs> and Alexander Hamilton. About which the current kid plays, please know. <laughs> and finally, for an international dimension, Lafayette. My personal problem is that I fear my wife may think I don't appreciate her getting me these great books because I've only finished one of them, reading a few pages on each metro ride. And I don't dare mention to her that she didn't include the John Adams biography. <laughs> At any rate, I am starting to learn much about our founding fathers. And that is what brings us together here this panel, to hear from the founding fathers and founding mothers of the food security measure and research based on it. We will hear from each uh, in person, which is better than some written biography and much more succinct, and better than hearing from just Washington or just Franklin, we have a full ensemble who will share their reminiscences and insights, achievements and challenges, and towards the end of our session, answer your questions. And with that, let's wind back the clock for training in history to just around the time of the American Revolution in food security <laughs> measurement. Ben Parker is our first panelist.
hard to imagine a, a world in which there aren't food banks and where, and where the large numbers of people are showing up uh, in long lines, although that's still happening in some extent. But that's what was happening in the early 1980s. The community organizations that Brad had worked with for decades came to us and said, we want to convince people there's a problem. Many of our policymakers just don't believe there's a problem in our community. They can't believe it. And also at the same time, the executive branch of the, of the government uh, started a prison's task force on food assistance, and they concluded, while we have found evidence of hunger, in the sense that some people have difficulty obtaining adequate uh, access to food, we have also found that it's, it's impossible at present to estimate the extent of hunger. So local and hunger organizations came to us and asked us to help them out uh, in, in trying to convince, measure and convince policymakers about what was going on. Kraft responded with, uh, among other things, a little brochure on how to document hunger in your community. But clearly that wasn't sufficient, and so was born the Community Childhood Hunger Identification Project. Um, in thinking about how to meet local community needs, it was very important to Kraft and to the anti-hunger community uh, advocates to develop a survey that was, uh, whose methodology was scientifically sound and that accurately, accurately represented Problem. Uh, we formed a technical advisory committee of survey research specialists and health experts uh, to do some of the fundamental thinking that would be required to develop such a measure, and a series of questions uh, and a whole methodology were developed to do this at the community level. Working with human service programs in Connecticut and Washington State, uh, we uh, and working also with local national survey experts, highly skilled principal investigator and well-trained data collectors that were surveyed for hired from the community. Uh, the survey uh, who developed a series of pilot surveys. And they were a great success. Uh, we were astonished, as were the local folks, at the enormous response from the results of the surveys when they were released. Uh, government officials and the press uh, were just <coughs> blown away by the results. And this is in the early 1980s and early to late 90s that the numbers that we were showing uh, uh, that represented the problems in their communities. And they responded with anti-hunger initiatives. They responded with program expansions with increased uh, money to deal with the problem. So then Pratt moved to expand this survey methodology across the country in various communities and completed two multi-site nationwide surveys, including national estimates based on uh, a use of census data with the current statistical techniques that were available. And uh, in 1991, the first national survey was also released. Uh, it was, with every local release, there was, again, this shock this, and concern and action. And with the 91 release, uh, for those of you who watch cable and everything else, you can't imagine what it meant, perhaps, that all three networks started with this story that night. Uh, that was the first story on their list of stories. And then the next morning, local and local newspapers, large and small, carried this on their front pages. It was the it was unprecedented at the time in the communications world of nonprofit organizations. Uh, and the results made an enormous difference. At first, some quarters were skeptical. You know, quick and dirty so study done by an but what happened was they looked at the way they did the survey, the meticulous nature of how it was done as, and imagined by our critical investigator and, and how it was done at the local community level. And so the discussion soon turned not to the methodology, and, but rather to what should we do about this problem? Because clearly there are different policy solutions depending on who's talking. So, and during the same period of time, I have to mention, harking back to what uh, Kathy Wojcicki talked about, FRAC and Bread for the World, along with a number of health and, and nutrition organizations, worked together <coughs> to, uh, over a long period of time to uh, pass legislation called the National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act. And, and what that bill contained was the hunger measure requirement. Uh, and so that combination, I think, of that required hunger measure, which HHS and USDA began to work on, and the, the uh, fundamental uh, sort of research and development that 
track did uh, served as a basis for the beginning of a national hunger mission, which then we call hunger because that's what we were most concerned about and that's what we talked about. So that's that's the beginning. Our next panelist is Christine Olson. Thank you. So I've been a professor at Cornell University since 1975 in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. I spent my entire academic career at Cornell. And most of the time that I've been there, I've had an extension outreach, research, and graduate teaching appointment. Cornell is one of these strange universities that is both private and public, and we are the land grant university for the state of New York. So we have this extension outreach mission. And um, it's in that context that um, in the late 80s, um, Cornell was very interested in um, nutrition surveillance and monitoring. Had a long tradition of working internationally in this area, but that was shifting to a focus on New York State because our governor and, our, and the New York State Department of Health were very interested in state level and county level and city level nutrition monitoring and surveillance. So in 1987, a graduate student named Kathy Radimer came along and with funding from the New York State Department of Health, did what we call a naturalistic or qualitative inquiry into the nature of food deprivation from the ground up, from the perspective of women with children and their families. Um, she interviewed 32 women, in-depth interviews with 32 women in rural and urban areas of, of New York State. And from what she did, I want to share with you a couple of the seminal contributions. And one was this idea that there really are two conceptions of what, as Lynn said, we were calling hunger at the time. And I'm going to read a quote from one of the women, which I think captures this uh, both narrow and broad conceptualization of hunger. Going hungry, hungry is when there is absolutely nothing in the house. But also going hungry is when you have to eat the same thing all week long and you have no variation from it and you know sooner or later you're gonna run out of that too because it's only gonna go so far. So each day you cut the portions down a little bit smaller and smaller, a little bit smaller, and you have a tendency to send your kid off to play with somebody else so that they're there at mealtime so that they do eat. So it was from that that this concept of food insecurity, this broad, uh, broader conceptualization of food deprivation called food insecurity emerged. Kathy's work also pointed out that the experience is different at the household and the individual level, and that, there, that this was a multi-dimensional construct that had a quantitative component, amount of food, a qualitative component, quality of the diet, a psychological component, anxiety and worry, and a social component. Um, Based on that conceptualization and using the words of the women she had interviewed, Kathy developed items that could measure these constructs that were at the intersection of the household individual level like, uh, uh, for uh, dimensions, went out then and did a survey with the population that she had drawn her original in-depth interview sample from and, and conducted the survey and got the data and then assessed the quality of the scales that emerged from that. So the result was what we call the Radimer Cornell Hunger and Food and Security Measure and a doctoral degree for Kathy Radimer. <laughs> 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 that was another very positive model about that. But then there was a second um, set of studies that people like Ed Frangelo and Ann Kendall Casella were involved in. It's great to have a measure, but you need to validate it. And again, with funding from the New York State Department of Health, we were able to administer a, a survey, the items that rather were developed, along with some other measures, to a random sample of a county in New York State. One of the problems with research up to that point in time is the samples had been gathered from what we would call at-risk populations, people who were showing up for food assistance for participating in food assistance programs. So from that, we assessed the criterion validity 
of the RAD or Cornell measure against household food supplies. If you can believe this, we went into people's households twice. We opened three weeks apart. We opened up the cupboards. We opened up the freezers. We looked at the food that was in the house. We also did assessments of dietary intake, particularly fruit and vegetables. And so based on that, we established the validity of the Radmore Cornell hunger and food security measures. And then a little bit later with that same data and led this effort, we did some work assessing the sensitivity and specificity of that measure. So I have to say, I have been astonished that these items in this scale have held up as well as they've held up across time. I will say we particularly focused on the least severe end of the scale because coming from a sort of a public health perspective, we believe it's easier to solve the problem early in the progression of the problem. If you wait till you get all the way to child comfort, you got a really big problem on your hands. So I've been pleased that the Division of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell University and myself could be involved in this. It's been personally very sad. So now we move from the passion of community organizers and the uh, logic of the scientific community to the reality of the bureaucratic government. <laughs> Which is where all the real action is actually. Um, so at the time we're talking about, I was a mid-level mid -level, uh, division director at the Food Nutrition Service, actually the Food Consumer Service at that time, about halfway through my career. I got a call at some point one afternoon, probably from Lynette, saying, we've got this new working group. We've got to come up with a measure of food security. Would you co-chair it? And in my naivety, I said, sure. <laughs> um, not exactly realizing what we were about to get into. Um, this was a time, as, as Lynn mentioned, that uh, the National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act was current, um, which was structuring systematizing nutrition monitoring efforts across the country at the national scale. It was the time of the Government Performance Results Act, which was creating a new emphasis on strategic planning and performance measurement for all of our government programs to prove that they work. Um, it was at the tail end of the uh, sort of political climate of the early Reagan years of the first Bush administration, which I have to tell you, as a career civil servant, that time, my uh, second level supervisor was a political appointee. Our view of the world tends to be a little changeable, malleable. So uh, during all the activity that Lynn and her colleagues were creating, we were compiling a huge file cabinet full of all these studies, figuring out how we can knock them down because <laughs> our folks didn't really want to support expansions of the programs at that time. Uh, we were fortunate that a couple of years later, uh, administrations changed release of the food security measure actually was uh, overseen by Vice President Gore, so the climate had changed and we had become great supporters of it. But at the time Ronette called, um, I, we actually had a really good working relationship. It had not been poisoned by the anecdotes that <laughs> Under Secretary Wilteki relayed. That was not me. <laughs> not part of that. Um, so we, we were, it seemed okay to, to take this down. The reason I bring up the political climate is that um, so I've always wondered in the years that have transpired since just how much our political appointees knew about what we were doing down in the bowels of their agencies. Now, Kevin, this never happened when I when you arrived. <laughs> I told you everything. <laughs> and if I didn't, I know that, that Rich is doing that now. <laughs> Back then, I sort of wondered how much they did. Um, because it was, it was all handled and sort of at the staff level. Um, we didn't have very large regions of our political appointees. We didn't have day-to-day um, -day scrutiny of what we were doing. With, frankly, I don't recall that we met a lot of resistance at the political level from what was going on. As you probably will hear as we go further, there was a lot of, the process was a little bumpy as we go through some of the bureaucratic hurdles of getting the clearance to do the surveys, a lot of debate over the questions and so on. But, it actually proceeded a little, quite a bit under the radar for most of the time. My own role in all of this, as I come to think about it over the years, um, 
have concluded was largely as one of a midwife. Um, I think all this stuff was going to happen anyway, with or without, uh, but that I had the good fortune of contribution such as it was, was to ensure a safer delivery, maybe a smoother, easier delivery, um, and then send this small child off into the world to do whatever it is it was going to do. Um, it was, uh, the challenge for me personally, uh, I think, was dealing with my friends and colleagues. <laughs> um, and just to, to give you a sense of that, uh, while we had a very large interagency group that had cut across probably a dozen different federal agencies. A lot of the key grunt work and legwork was done by what came to be known within FNS as the Feisty Group. <laughs> um, five individuals, Gary Bickle, Mark Vanders, two of them, um, as well as Bruce Klein, Sharon Christopher. I said five. I think it was four. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Memories are not as good as they used to be. Well, no, I don't know. <laughs> I did not contribute to any of the feistiness. I, I, I right, uh, tried to be above the frame. But it was, it was managing the, the perspectives, the attitudes, the approach to all of this that uh, presents a challenge in any project of this magnitude, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm going to stop there since Mark has stood up and uh, pass the microphone on to Gary with one observation. I've said this to his face, so it won't be a surprise. Gary was really the creative genius within our agency uh, to pull all, all of this together. I describe Gary as a man of 100 ideas, one or two of which are actually pretty good. You know, my all stands right in the city I personally have roots in agriculture, which is a, used to be a slogan of the RS. Is it still? Yeah, my first and one of my best friends when I came to FNS was Davis Mull. Because FNS and ERS were in the same building. <laughs> ERS was on the ground floor, of course. We were fifth floor, I guess. <coughs> but at any rate, Dave sort of showed me the ropes. Uh, Mark suggested some very, very uh, pressing questions. What was your own personal greatest contribution? Uh, what were the greatest obstacles you faced? So the obstacles were invariably people. <laughs> David was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> people, people who didn't get um, I, I've always felt that experiential knowledge, it's sometimes it's called existential knowledge, that you get from your own experience is just so much solider and richer and accurate than what you get through book writing. For that reason, I, I really, really appreciated Cheryl Whitt. Cheryl grew up in a low-income family in rural Pennsylvania. She knew what food insecurity was. I don't know about hunger, but she certainly knew food insecurity. So she really had a tacking eye. And the chip set the community child created one of the first data sets that had exactly, exactly the indicators that were needed later on. Um, my personal contribution, uh, I think I just had a good eye for talent <laughs> an instinct to try and pull people together. And um, uh, uh, also, by then at FMS, uh, I had experience in federal government contracting, you know, writing an RFP, which is basically writing a research plan, you know, and telling the people you're paying money, go out and do it. <laughs> Steve had a slogan, which I love. I'd come up with one of those many ideas, <laughs> and Steve would say, make it happen. <laughs> and sometimes it did, and <laughs> other times it didn't. Steve, by the way, um, is very few talking about life of talent is very few people select their own boss. <laughs> but I did. Because <laughs> when I came to FNS, Steve was the, uh, the sole researcher in the food stamp program. And he really wanted to 
to get into the research branch, and I came into FNS as the head of the, the research office. And I said, sure, you bet. We need some talent here. We didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Pittsburgh Conference, which many of you were here as well, with um, negotiating with the Census Bureau on the structure and content of the Food Security Supplement, and shepherding the annual data collection uh, clearance for the office management and budget. Transfer to ERS of 1998, um, it matched the time period where Congress also decided to transfer a lot of the funding of FNS Food Nutrition Research, including the funding for the Food Security Supplement and <laughs> associated research activities to ERS. So by being there at ERS, I had a chance there to do some smoothing on the transfer. Um, I continue to liaison with the current population survey there. I uh, shepherded a clearance with the office of management and budget. And I organized the second food security measurement research uh, conference. Um, the, um, you know, as the years went by, the first couple of years, Mark Nord assumed more and more of the technical and organizational responsibilities. As I transitioned into a position in the Food Systems and Nutrition Research Program with Jake Smallwood as Deputy Director for Food Systems Research. But I, I continued on until my retirement uh, with involving in the uh, oversight of some of their research activities and uh, marginal role in the reporting of the uh, findings and staff um, uh, and some of my own research and food security measurement activities. <coughs> so over this long career, in my view, it was the years from 1998 to 2001 that were among the most critical years in the development of the measure. Well, it, the FNS research has been seen as promising in the CPS. Supplement was already under production. There, there was this tension at the transition of funding between FNS and ERS actors. Um, without control of the research funding, the FNS uh, managers and staff had to adapt to new collaboration role with ERS researchers, some of which were openly skeptical of the whole project and wasn't sure ERS needed to be involved in all, at all. Um, there were concerns also among people in the food security research community that the substantial funding that had been transferred to ERS was going to get transferred into the operating ERS budget and gradually uproaded and support to the process uh, in, in the process being diminished. Uh, in addition, ERS managers and staff at that time had little experience with the current population survey. They had not worked closely with us in managing the budget. And um, some actors at the office of management and budget were openly hostile to the measure. So um, in that context, we um, organized and carried out the second Food Security Measurement and Research Conference in Alexandria, Virginia in, in February 23-24 of 99. And in my view, this was pivotal, pivotal in exposing some of these concerns and um, Revolving some of the issues. Again, the conference brought together uh, renowned researchers in the area, many of whom were here, and there were ses sessions that summarize an ongoing research and sessions that organized a dialogue about what needed to go on in the future. Um, the, there were many outsiders, but I think for me the high point of this, um, because so many economists in ERS were, were worried about this, 
were the remarks of Agnes Deaton, who is the recently announced Nobel laureate in economics, who um, stated that even though this research was not well known to most mainstream economists, um, they were unfamiliar with the whole idea of food security research, thought of it more as a subjective measure. That he was seeing, and I quote, an astonishingly, astonishingly impressive research program. So um, that, that um, for me, was a, a important moment. But um, <laughs> there continued, uh, despite all these positive vibes, there continued to be issues raised regarding the advisability of measuring hunger and individual measuring the household survey, the um, acceptability of the use of the term severe hunger to measure um, our um, the end of the food security scale. And um, given the lack of close association between income measures and food insecurity measures. There was a concern that there needed to be more research that would, would link this food security measure to uh, health, nutritional, and other program outcomes. So overall, though, I see this conference as having served to solidify the support of food security in its new home. Idea. 
Uh, so Apt eventually won that contract. And then they educated us more about it. I can learn something from them. Uh, they did a pretty good job with it. They left us with a few statistical issues that we're still probably dealing with. But mostly, they did really good work on it. Uh, they were very rigorous. They only used one eighth of the sample to develop the measure so that they could test it in the other part of the house with contamination and so on. So that was all good. Um, eventually, I, I did do a little more formal study on, on methods and um, helped the thing along a little bit along the way. Um, I, I'll be talking at a later session of now about kind of moving this out to 150 countries. So this, it gets it gets it. Um, so from there, um, I want to talk a little bit about a perilous past. If you if you go back and look at, at publication dates on the reports, you'll notice that 2001, 2002 reports were were published 10 months after data collection. But the 2000 report uh, was published 18 months after data collection, and it's a lot fatter than the 1999 report. Uh, so what was going on here. Well, during that time, there was another report published. We were requested, actually, by the uh, political side uh, of, of uh, USDA. Couldn't we do something about state-level uh, prevalence rates? And we we gave a lot of caveats. So, uh, it was three years of data. The samples were kind of small. We'll have to publish uh, margins of error with it and so on. But they agreed to all of this. So uh, in September of 1999, we published Problems of Food Insecurity and Hunger by State. We were still using hunger language in that, at that time, uh, 1996 to 98. Gary was a co-author on it, along with me. And uh, Kyle Jemison, who was then at the ERF. Well, during the primary in New Hampshire, right after this report came up, somebody pointed out to then candidate Bush uh, how high the levels of food insecurity and hunger were in Texas. And his response wasn't too constructive. Um, now, I don't know if this was good politics or bad politics, but it wasn't real good for popularity of uh, USDA's food security measurement project when uh, Mr. Bush became president. I'm not sure how much of our struggle in, over the 2000 data was related to that, maybe to other things going on in the government, I was pretty junior, so I'm sure I wasn't getting told everything, but I was given to know by uh, then division uh, director Betsy Kuhn that, um, that there was some upset out there in the appropriation side and the halls of Congress that they were picking up on the side events and so on, she and the, and the administrator. Uh, that I, I kind of picked up the idea that they were a little afraid that this might you know, really have bad implications for the whole organization, or at least for its budget. And so if they wanted to fatten up the report a little bit, couldn't we put some other stuff in there? Could this be a report on well-being and then food insecurities in there? And we looked at possibilities, and eventually came up with the, the solution that no, we need to keep it focused on food, and the food security stuff should be in there, but then we'll add in food spending, because we had data on that, and kind of make some ties there, and then the food assistance programs and how those relate to food security. And so that's when the, when the, when the report went from that thing to that thing, and it more or less took on its current form. Uh, and it was partly to provide some, some cover, I guess you'd say, political cover. But I think it was also to just delay the whole process until after the appropriations and all that stuff, so that eventually that got published and we got through that part. I think now the measure is well enough established, it would be politically very hard to get rid of it, but um, you never know, so cautionary tale from that perilous past. <coughs> Thank you. There are a couple of questions that any members of the audience may uh, have in common that I'm going to pose to the panel before taking on your individual uh, Q&As. So, uh, for whoever wants to answer, we can just um, pass the mic along. What was the biggest challenge that you faced? I think the, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge we faced, there's two sort of related ones. One is 
that it was very difficult to convince policymakers and the broader public that hunger was a major problem, but even more that it could be measured. Uh, we, we will, I will, we went to foundations which would go unnamed, who told us that it couldn't be measured, and they weren't interested in spending any money on helping us do that. And there also uh, were academics who actually said, don't even bother, it can't be measured. Uh, and I remember Cheryl Whaler coming out of one of those meetings almost in tears because of the, to, the inability of these folks to have the vision to see that this could be something that wouldn't be able to afford. And finally, the financial. Kraft ultimately um, raised $3 million and in, 19, in early 1980s, that was it's a heck of a lot of money now, but it was even more than that, which paid for our work as well as all of the work of all the groups across the country. And we finally, corporate foundations uh, like Kraft and uh, American Can Company were the ones who really helped us get things started. So that, and the capacity, we, we, had, we had never done anything like this before, and our anti-hunger groups at the local level had never done anything like this before. So we had to build with uh, Cheryl and others, our technical advisor for community health, we had to build a whole cadre of folks across the country who for the first time were, were doing survey research in the communities. So I'd like to piggyback on what Lynn said related to can you measure this? Um, and it speaks to in the academic part of this. In academia, we tend to live in disciplinary silos or strict disciplinary boundaries. At Cornell, one of the things we say about our nutrition department is we study nutrition as an integrating discipline. We integrate across a lot of disciplines. Radmer's initial work springs from a rich tradition in sociology that you can know something by observing it very closely, from talking to people who had the experience of it, and then objectively analyzing the narrative and the observations that come from that. That's a new way of looking at the world for people in disciplines of economics and some of the more quantitative disciplines. So it's totally understandable how people were skeptical of an experientially based measure direct measure of the phenomenon, the phenomena of hunger and food insecurity. But I think Radmer showed <laughs> that this can be done. Um, and so that was a challenge, but I, I think also a contribution. And it's something we all should remember, that we bring the biases of our discipline to the things that we study, and we have to be open to other paradigms and other perspectives on some of these issues. I just want to amplify on Mark's last point as well, because I think, think the biggest challenge for us, the federal government, who tried to systematize all of this over the last 20 years, was that there were innumerable steps where only one person had to say, no, stop, don't do it, and it would stop. Appropriators could put language in the annual appropriation bill that forbids the use of funding for this. The folks at the Office of Management and Budget can deny clearance of the paperwork burden actually put in the CPS. The folks at this Census Bureau could have said, this goes beyond what we feel comfortable with. We don't want to use up our supplement time for this. All of our own bosses could have said, I'm uncomfortable with it. I don't, I don't want you to spend any more time on it. And it would have been done. I mean, it's really quite remarkable that over the course of this whole history, especially <coughs> in the years, that even though we got a lot of resistance, a lot of pushback, and there was conflict and all of that, no one got to the point where they said, stop, don't do it. I wanted to say something quick because it's one of these things that you wonder, how in the heck did this happen? So this was when Catherine Bertini was in her position of Well, the she, she, she quite the, 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 the other secretary. Under secretary. Catherine is from Portland, New York, which is 20 miles north of Ithaca. And um, when she got her position, her family that runs a funeral home, ran a funeral home in Portland at the time, had a reception, and as the assistant dean for research and graduate studies in college and ecology, I was invited, the dean was invited, blah, blah, blah. As, possibly as a result of that, out of the clear blue sky, I get a call from one of her assistants
and Sue Ann Richko, that did I want, with one of my other colleagues, Kathy Campbell, come and meet with Catherine Bertini and talk to her about hunger and food insecurity. I was a nutrition professor at Cornell, I should know something about this. We went, we talked, it was all very pleasant, but I hope maybe that possibly that had something to do with her not being one of the people who said no along the way. <laughs> The question is, did you think that the measure would have the acceptance and significance that it has today? No. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to, the second question is the greatest achievement, and I don't want to, uh, Go right I don't want to you know, forget about this. What I thought about, I don't think I ever thought much about how significant in the future anyway. Uh, and this isn't this isn't a personal achievement, but I think one of the uh, things that made the measure as significant as it is was the finding the institutional home at ERS. Uh, the one of the this this uh, statistical model underlying it, every now and then in my skeptical moments I say the greatest contribution to that was that it made it complicated enough that you had to put it in an agency with <laughs> Economists and sociologists and humanity. <laughs> Otherwise, it was just a couple of questions. It would have been so simple. It wouldn't have had an institutional home. Uh, but housing at a place that has the political protection of a statistical agency and the expertise across at least three disciplines at least nutrition, sociology, and economics, and probably a few others, um, I think really. There was a lot going on there that doesn't come out on the surface, but the fact that we were able to provide technical support to researchers across the country in counties and state offices and nonprofits doing research and academic, uh, academic departments doing research, that, that, that ERS was seen as that home of the measure where you get authoritative information on how to use it, how to analyze the data, and so on. Um, I think that was an important uh, achievement of the organization. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question because it really is this on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> because it really was like threading a whole bunch of needles. And each needle was a new obstacle. The challenge of getting through all of those. Let me mention just a couple of instances. One of the places that had to give approval was the office of the statistician of the United States. I didn't even know there was such a thing. <laughs> but it had to be approval. Now, up until this time, Stephen left the technical jargon and explanation largely in the feisty group's hands. But at this point, he knew he had to make that presentation to the statistician of the United States. So he called me in and asked me to give him a step-by-step -step tutorial. And he's a good study, so he really had it down. And uh, we were at the meeting, of course, but none of us were saying anything. Steve did a masterful job of laying out what the measurement was on a technical basis to a statistician. <laughs> now, I'll mention one more, because Bob Dalrymple, who was here, uh, was, was instrumental in getting us through this room. It was when we were, I mentioned earlier that Bruce Klein an old labor economist was aware of a <coughs> monthly supplement to the current population survey. Now the rest of us were. So he put us onto that, and we started working with people at the at an agency of the Census Bureau, Center for Survey Method and Research, something like that, sorry. and uh, going out to a lot of meetings with them. And they had <laughs> the guy who ran it, Bob Somebody, who was a uh, sort of a good old boy, <laughs> bureaucrat. We got along just fine with him. Uh, but they had a, a high-powered uh, academic advisor, uh, Eleanor Singer. Eleanor Singer, who was a survey methods expert. And so she knew how this should be done, including changing the wording of the questions. And we said, Eleanor, you can't. We can't change the wording because that is part of this experiential 
knowledge base. I mean, that's the essence of the things that she just didn't get. It. Except she did, but in an amazing way. Well, I mentioned Bob. Bob really went to bat with us there at the <coughs> Census Bureau Center for Survey Method Research, and I think he made a very big difference. But Eleanor Singer was changed by this experience. Not openly, but unconsciously. She told us one day of a dream that she had. <laughs> <laughs> the dream was one in which she had set up a fancy dinner party. All the guests were invited. Everything was prepared, except at the last moment she realized she hadn't gotten any food. <laughs> Did any other panelists have a uh, final thoughts before we open up the Q&A on the greatest achievement of you and your organization, or did you anticipate the acceptance and significance of the, anticipate the acceptance and the significance of the measures? Thank you. I just want to follow up on Gary on the Census Bureau issue, because it, it really was something that we really had to
that has different meanings for different people in connection with this measure. And so what do you do when you have this kind of a scientific question that can't be resolved between agencies and within agencies? The government can throw it to the National Academies, uh, which is, they're not, nothing in Washington is completely unpolitical, but the most unpolitical is the National Academies. And so they call this panel and they debate it and so on. I mean, you should get somebody that was on that panel to talk about why they came up where they did. But one of their recommendations was that we should probably, it would be most useful to, to um, conceptualize hunger as an individual physiological thing and food insecurity as a social economic condition. And that if you want to talk about hunger, you should measure it as that physiological condition and therefore you could study the relationship between the two, which you can't do if you measure measuring hunger with a member of food security. Okay, so once the National Academies weighed in on this, I, my recommendation <coughs> to, to ERS, to USDA was, you know, you ask them to make a recommendation, and they make a recommendation, they have to have a really strong reason to not go there, so we better make the change. The specific language chosen wouldn't have been my choice, but even though I was one brought it as one of the many options to be considered. I thought it would be rejected. But, <laughs> <laughs> but there weren't any really better alternatives. Yeah. There were it, no good advice. It, it, it probably should be noted that every other country in the world that has done either has integrated this measure as a uh, as part of their statistical system. There are four other countries besides the US. Or that has done major national surveys with it, they've all ended up dropping hunger out of their labeling. Um, and this was done independently of the fact that the US did it. it. It seems like the word has too many different meanings to too many different people or something. So we're not at least the outlier on that. I Thank still, you. I still regret it at times, but anyway, that's the way it went. Yeah, one, one side, note, side note to that whole debate, because it was a big part of my life, too. <laughs> but I was grateful you were the public face of it. So. <laughs> um, but the, the one thing that I want to highlight in all this is that, um, truth be told, this was not a political decision. Uh, I was the one who was presenting all these alternatives to Undersecretary Eric Boston at that time. And frankly, he didn't care. Um, I don't think we spent more than 10 minutes talking about this issue. The issue of what the label was was never a problem for him. None of the political officials at that time weighed in with me on, on all of this. This is an issue that we brought on ourselves as career staff. We are the ones who asked the National Academy to review what we were doing. I don't recall that we asked them to review specifically the labels. They, of their own accord, came up with that stuff. We, we include that in a vague sort of way. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the argument that both Mark and I were making is, well, once you ask these experts to weigh in and make a recommendation, you're sort of stuck with what they recommend. I, if I had one regret, it probably would be that I didn't push harder uh, with Eric in those days to say, let's, let's just say no. <laughs> let's, let's keep what we've got, because it does speak. But the, the only thing I want to do in defense of the process is, is to emphasize that it was not a political decision. This was really made at the career level as a result of the request we made to the academies, at least from the FNS perspective. Okay. You know, the, the, the terminology is powerful, and hunger is a dynamite word. Um, I have in my files a cartoon from the day uh, of uh, a very disheveled looking family, very deep down in a, living in a hovel, paint peeling off the walls, and an aggressive interviewer is pushing a microphone at him. Yes, you're unemployed and below the poverty line, but are you hungry? <laughs> that was the political thing. I, I want to give another example. The second research contract, apt. Chris Hamilton bringing, bringing in the whole concept of uh, rush measurement was really splendid, but we gave the second contract to NPR. After the NPR, a big rocket was but the same thing. It was so much better to have your main rival being a part of the thing rather than being outside sniping it. 
So we gave the second contract to NPR. And Tom Fraker was an employee at that time of NPR. And uh, you know, writing up their stuff, I simply told Tom, you've got to do it this way. I, I know I know it regularly, but you've got to do it. Um, in your write-up, do, do not use any probabilistic language. Well, the Rosh measurement is a probabilistic <laughs> measure. It doesn't fit individuals as such. It just locates where they are in the probability sense along the scale. Uh, but I had previously worked on a Senate subcommittee on employment, poverty, and migratory labor. And I knew how those people, you know, committee staff, and not to mention the members, you use the word probability, bingo, they're total, you know, they, they will totally discount it, set aside, they can't deal with it. <laughs> we have time for another question from the floor? <laughs> I think uh, that's testimony to the uh, thoroughness and thoroughness.